Hey, what's up, everybody? It is Kellen here from Start Your Systems, and welcome back to Monster Energy Supercross 5, the official video game. Jumping back to 5 again today to do a little bit of Daytona action on a 125, because why not? Um, because the Daytona Supercross just happened in real life over the weekend, I felt like this was a good little fun video to do, playing it on a 125, but this is obviously the two-year-old Daytona version. Supercross 6 will have almost an exact replica of the track that was raced this past weekend in Daytona when it comes out later this week on March 9th, so revving up for that a little bit of course but uh yeah this is the 2021 version of daytona supercross so it's not exactly like what we saw on the weekend or anything like that but uh it still gives you kind of the same vibes right it's at the speedway it's got the sand it's got all this other stuff and it was you know pretty much the same deal this past weekend so we're going to talk about the race and we're also going to shred a 125 and see if i can't beat my ghost on a couple of these uh tries i know that i did make a mistake on this ghost here on the first lap so i might be able to beat it pretty quick but then after that might be a bit of a challenge so we're gonna have some fun with it today talk about the real daytona supercross that just happened like i said um and kind of break it down so if you haven't watched daytona yet i would definitely recommend switching off the video so that you get to watch it first before you hear my thoughts and opinions on it but this is our usual review video that we're going to do here today and just going to run over some things real quick i was not in daytona this weekend as opposed to when i normally am in daytona on or not Daytona, but normally at the Supercross on the weekend covering them because I work in the media, but was not there this past weekend. Instead, uh, was at my cousin's engagement party. So congratulations to them. And um, yeah, so we're going to do some some couch surfing coverage here. But if you didn't watch it, Eli Tomac won his seventh Daytona Supercross. Uh, Hunter Lawrence won the 250 East race. So he extended his championship lead out to 14 points. And there's a little bit of drama involved there. But just off the top, talking about Eli Tomac versus Cooper Webb at that main event, very close for a long time. I thought that there seeming, seemed to be a chance that Webb was going to win that race on a couple different occasions. First of all, he led the race for a long time, so you think, oh, yeah, maybe he's going to be able to hold on to it from here. But then um, in the case of Tomac catching and passing him, you know, Webb missed a shift after the finish line jump, clicked in a neutral, and that ultimately cost him. But also uh, he maybe was going to get passed anyway. It seemed like Eli had a little bit more pace in hand, and, and by the time... The mistake happened. Eli was actually able to stretch it out a little bit, but then Webb clawed it back, and, and we know how good Webb is as a uh, as a closer in this sport, so figured uh, maybe something could happen there a little bit as well where he would close the gap down late and make it a little bit interesting, but it never quite got back to that level. Uh, but still, it was I thought it was a pretty good race. Like On TV, it was, it was pretty close the whole time. I think in person, a lot of people said it was a fantastic race to watch, so um, all of that's obviously very exciting from a series standpoint. Um, just to be able to have a good close Daytona. The only thing that's a bummer about it is because it was Webb, or uh, excuse me, Tomac, Webb, Sexton, one, two, three. That's the same order they were in the championship coming into this race. And because of that, <clears throat> now we have the championship even further extended apart than it already was, which I kind of didn't want to see happen. I was hoping somebody else other than Tomac would win Daytona just to keep it a little bit closer. But now it's five points up on Webb is Eli Tomac and 10 points up on Sexton. Uh, so those guys need to respond. They need to win Indianapolis, and, and I think that uh, they can for sure, but it's uh, a bummer that it didn't happen to Daytona to make it closer for Indianapolis, so then we have a little bit more of a wide-open series. Eli Tomac just looks so good at Daytona, though. I don't know how you ever would consider betting against him. I mean, he's won it seven times. I think he's finished on the podium every other time besides the times that he's won it. He's been so good there over the years. And what was weird about that race to me is that while Tomac did look really good, um, I never really felt at any point in time that I was like, oh my God, Tomac is going way faster than everybody else. He's so good here. This is incredible. Uh, it just kind of slowly materialized into a situation where he was able to get the lead. He was able to run faster laps than everybody else, but he wasn't like blowing my mind or anything like that. So I don't know if it was just that's how fast they were all going and Tomac wasn't able to like blow our minds because he's going way faster than them or whatever. But uh, he definitely looked like he was pushing like after the finish line, he looked like he was really elated to win that one and um you know they got him up on the podium talking to james stewart and ricky carmichael about passing ricky and no longer being in a tie with him and only being one back of james stewart so he could win his 50th supercross this weekend in indianapolis which would be kind of crazy to see um but yeah i mean that's kind of it like it was a pretty straightforward race i think probably the biggest talking point from the actual main event was the sexton barsha drama and barsha after the race he spoke with uh, vital mx's michael Lindsay about it and basically said, like, yeah, Chase and I are buddies. Like, we'll still be buddies after this. But he was kind of annoyed that twice Chase came over on him. And he's like, I know I'd, I, know he didn't do it on purpose, but you can't keep doing it over and over again and just expect me to be okay with it. So 
He said they got into it a little bit after the race and were heated, but they're still buddies and probably still will be. But I, I would almost wonder if that would maybe make both of them race each other a little bit differently moving forward. Um, maybe not. Maybe they just stay pretty cool and chill with each other. Barsha's actually, in my opinion, kind of tried to stay away from some of the drama this year. I don't feel like he's been like full takeout mode every single weekend or anything like that. But uh, yeah, I would be uh, interested to see if this bite sex in it all a little bit. Just because, like, again, neither of them were really like his fault. Like, he made a mistake and then uh, was trying to just kind of block the line and came back over in front of Barsha. And then Barsha landed on him in the rhythm section before the Supercross triple. And then uh, he stalled it after or in the off camber corner and then Barsha pulled up alongside of him and then Sexton crossed back over right next to him and uh then Barsha landed on him and went down and then Sexton lost a bunch of time and then suddenly what was a four rider train out front quickly divulged into something much grander than that with the two leaders pretty much gone and Webb and Tomac so um that was a bit of a disappointment there but I, I don't see it really carrying over much after that and like I said I just hope that for championship's sake that we still have some close dramatic racing between Tomac Webb and Sexton moving forward and it doesn't divulge into a two rider series which I don't think it will I mean I, I really do think that at the moment Sexton is still the outright fastest rider on the track almost at, <clears throat> almost every time but he just can't seem to put it together in the main events for whatever reason so as soon as he starts figuring it out in the main events I feel like it'll tighten that series back up towards the front a little bit but we'll see we'll see if we're going to get too late in the season before he figures it out or other things will perhaps change um Anyway, that's kind of enough about the 450s. Not a whole lot going on there. Justin Cooper got six, but he's now going to be done and go back to racing a 250 for Pro Motocross. So he's getting ready for the outdoors. Uh, RJ Hampshire made his 450 debut and finished, I think, eighth. And uh, he rode really, really well and was on my fantasy team. So I was stoked about that. Um, but yeah, you know, just kind of a synopsis from 450 class. Let's talk 250 class here, not to go too long on the video here today. Uh, Hunter Lawrence wins, but like I said, not without some drama. And it came in the form of on the first lap of the main event, he goes down the inside in the sand U-turn and Nate Thrasher, yeah, maybe he could have defended. But again, I don't think these guys are always looking to defend the inside lines on the first lap of the race. And so they were in second place. They were behind Tom Vial. And I mean, it's just straight up. Lawrence t took Thrasher out. Like I, he says that he didn't really know that Thrasher was going to cut down the way that he did and everything like that, and I believe him. But also, you have to know that where you're going in that corner down the inside like that is probably going to generate some contact and most likely will put somebody on the ground, and that's exactly what happened. Thrasher went down, was all the way in dead last, started charging forward, then crashed heavily again on the uh, step-on, step-off quad section before the big like tunnel jump thingy, and... Uh, yeah, it just was a bad night for Thrasher in the end, and now he's 29 points down in the championship, and it wasn't like he was close anyway because he'd already kind of blown it with a 15th at the first round, but now another rough round really puts the championship kind of out of reach. And I think the the real crux of that whole storyline is if you're Hunter Lawrence, like you just kind of created a little bit of a beef you probably didn't need to because now, you know, Max Anstey is 14 points down in this championship, and it does seem like it's Lawrence's championship to lose, but you can lose it by creating enemies. And I don't think that Thrasher's necessarily like saying, I hate Hunter Lawrence with a passion or anything like that. But I do think next time Thrasher and Lawrence are on the same stretch of track that Thrasher is not going to do him any favors and potentially will give him a little bit of payback. So I think that's the only thing that if you're Lawrence, you're kind of like, but why? Like you already had a big championship lead on Thrasher. Yes, you don't want him to run away with the win, and this obviously puts him at a huge detriment in the championship, but then you also maybe you shoot yourself in the foot with a potential payback at a later date or something like that. So that's the only thing that would be maybe a little bit worrisome about that whole situation is you don't want it to turn into a situation where it turns out into a takeout war between the two of them and has nothing to do with the championship picture anymore. But I don't know, maybe that lightens up the championship as well where Thrasher pays Lawrence back this weekend at Indy and Anstey breaks through for his first win and suddenly we have a championship picture that's a little bit closer and more opened up. I don't know. Um, again, to me, the takeout wasn't even that bad. Like it's whatever. He took him out. It happens. The contact on the racetrack. But the fact that Lawrence is kind of making a bit of a habit with this now is he's taken out uh, Moseman this year and he definitely got into it with Thrasher and there was the cross jump situation back uh, at Arlington last week that you know thrasher crossed over him and, and lawrence didn't appear to be mad initially but maybe i don't know maybe he actually was mad um all those things add up and so uh you know maybe he was adding a little bit more fuel to the flame by taking him down and for the sake of him hopefully it doesn't come back to bite him but maybe in the sake of this series it does actually come back around to get him so we'll have to see about that 
Ansi gets second place in the main event. For a little while, it looked like he might actually close on Hunter to challenge for the win, but doesn't get close enough to do anything really in the end. Um, and that's just cool for Max. Like He's just been solid as a rock this year and probably should have four podiums in four rounds, but went down with Lawrence in the first corner of the Arlington Triple Crown, and that cost him a podium. Uh, and, and he's just been really good, so I, I'm stoked to see that for Max. And now, of course, we have to talk about the one, the only Mr. Hayden Deegan getting his first ever 250 Supercross podium. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, De Deegan's been just about as solid as Ansi, I guess, except for the 15th in the first uh, race of the Triple Crown, which, to be honest, was a weird one. Like, watching it in person, I know that, you know, on TV it didn't get a whole lot of coverage, but in person, he didn't look good in that first race. It wasn't like he... He, he got a bad start, but he wasn't, like, knifing through people to get up into the top 10 or anything like that. And then he crashed all by himself and went back to outside. Of, I think he was, like, 17th, 18th or something like that and just slowly made passes forward. And he wasn't riding that good. So that's, like, the only blemish on his resume thus far is that he's got, you know, two fourth-place finishes and a third and then a weird uh, triple crown race, which I think he ended up sixth overall in that one, uh, going 15-5-4. I don't know. Eighth sounds more correct, actually, now that I think of it. But, uh, yeah, like, he's been really, really good. Uh, I would say maybe as advertised so far because uh, there's obviously a lot of hype around him. But for me, I look at it from the standpoint of, like, what is he like as a racer? And, and really what I, I think of it so far is he's got a lot of the rookie tendencies, in my opinion, in some areas where he'll maybe go a little bit over the top with either a pass attempt or, uh, you know, trying to push too hard and maybe it ends up with a swap or something weird like that. But also, the one thing that stood out to me, and I've said this before on some of my reviews already, that really is huge for a 17-year-old, and Jet Lawrence was kind of doing this as well in pro motocross when he was 17 years old. Dude, he is very good at managing a race pace. And what I mean by that is... Yes, he may go out the first two laps and throw absolute caution to the wind and ride maybe a little over his head or whatever, but he is very self-aware to stop, reflect on how much of a race is left beyond just the first couple laps, and stretch you know, himself a little bit back into a normal trend instead of stretch himself thin by going balls to the walls for too long. And that, that to me, is really impressive. Like That's the kind of stuff that uh, you can't teach. That's the kind of stuff that... He's learned probably from, you know, watching others go through the same trials and tribulations ahead of him. But he's also just smart enough to know that within himself, he can't override and over push the track for 15 minutes straight because he's going to go down and he cannot go down. Like he has to stay on two wheels. He has to make it through this whole season healthy because this is such a valuable learning experience. Like if he continues the trend that he's on and look, I know he's like within reason still close enough to a championship this year that you could be like, well, you could still win the title this year, but I don't think he will. I think that if he continues to progress the way that he has this year, immediately comes into the picture of a title guy next year uh, for Supercross, in my opinion. And so he's doing everything right by the book, doesn't need to go out and win to really show what he's made of or anything like that. People are watching and learning and understanding uh, what he's doing. And I don't think anybody's really shouting, oh, you know, look at him now, he sucks. He's doing exactly what he should be doing, and, and I think it's really tremendous. And I, the first podium meant a lot for him. Being at Daytona, it seemed like it was extra special. The family was really stoked, and I'm sure the Deegan vlog from this past weekend will be very much watched. But uh, it's just cool to see. Like It's cool that there's so much hype around him coming in and that so far he's done exactly what he should be doing. Uh, I, if he went out and crashed his brains out at round one, like it would just kind of deflate a lot of the attention that's been associated with this series. And, and I like that so far he's been within himself, riding strong and passing some really good dudes to get on the podium. And it's just cool to see. So that's my synopsis really about Hayden Deegan. And overall, that's my synopsis about this race here. Uh, round eight of the Monster Energy AMA Supercross Championship from Daytona as we shred a 125 on the old Daytona and Monster Energy Supercross 5, the video game. Uh, let me know what you guys think about the race from the past weekend and some other things that maybe I didn't touch on that I can continue to hit on in the chat section below. But thanks, guys, for tuning in to another video here on Start Your Systems. I'll see you guys in the next one. So long for now.